Time being four o'clock, I'm calling this meeting to order. Um, uh, if you would, and uh, please turn your cell phones, your smartphones. I still have a dumb phone, <laughs> but still, uh, smartphones to off so we don't have to listen to them during the meeting. Um, and I will be attempting today to do this all through my uh, iPad. Uh, you're welcome, Tom. Uh, <laughs> so if I'm a little bit slow, I'm sorry, but I'm going to get it right. So thank you very much. Uh, first order of business, Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm going to ask James Gumpel. Did I say that right, James? Yes. Ready? Yeah. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Diana, you have a roll call, please. Director Evans? Here. Director Hernandez? Here. Director Polo? Here. Director Martin? Here. <clears throat> okay, we'd like to adopt the agenda for our regular meeting today. Move to approve. Motion. Okay. And a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Approve. Next up is uh, oral communication. And this would be for any persons wishing to address a matter not on the agenda may be heard at this time. However, no action will be taken until the matter is placed on a future agenda in accordance with board policy. I don't, haven't gotten any, so there aren't any, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, notice to the public uh, on the agenda items. All matters listed under the consent calendar will be voted upon by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member or member of the public requests that a particular item be removed from the consent calendar, in which case it will be considered separately under action items. Do we have any of those by the board, by the public? No. Okay. Mr. Yep. President? Yes, sir. Now you don't have any yourself? Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, I do. I was shocked. It's the first time in a year. That's why I asked. Well, I, I don't know that I want to pull them from the consent count. I'm just going to question them. So uh, if we have a motion and uh, a move. second, then I, then I will ask okay. my question. I'll apply. You'll move. I'll second. Okay, I will move. Motion, move, and second. And then I, I do wish to uh, have a few questions to ask. Uh, number one, if the uh, board would look at uh, item 1.1. Uh, approval of the minutes, and if we go to uh, fog ordinance, page eight, on today's agenda, page eight. Am I on the right page, folks? Yeah, if you, if you I, I did speak with Director Martin about this, and the issue was the um, putting the fee for six months in advance. Mm -hmm. And the way we wrote the minutes, it was just to suspend it for six months. The intent was to suspend for six months and then reconsider. Right. The intent, the intent of my motion was yeah. to bring it back in six months and reconsider uh, the fee, not, just, not the program. Right. Just right. the fees and the fee schedule, uh, so I just want the minutes to, to note that and change that. Correct. If that's acceptable to the motion maker and the second. Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you. And then I have a couple of questions on the warrants. On page uh, 13. Um, page 13, we have Manpowers, Inc. That we hired someone, I'm assuming temporarily, but you can explain that better than I, for $2,700 to read meters? Yes, sir. Um, we're down a one meter reader right now, and so we brought in a temporary from Manpower to come in and help us out uh, to help with the reading and also with the maintenance. Uh, my question is, is, is that not a technical job? I mean, do you just hire somebody from Manpower that's able to do that? It's, it, it's fairly technical. Um, we can do training when they get here. They have to have the right skill set in order for us to bring them on and train them, but 
Yeah, a lot of people, um, not a lot of people, but there are those with uh, the technical ability to at least get started. Yeah. Okay, but uh, are we looking to hire someone or is there someone? No, we have a person out on an injury. Oh. Medical injury right now. And then he's returned, so we no longer have the temporary employee. Okay, thank you. Uh, also on page 13, uh, <laughs> Thomas Potter, uh, we, we placed a wall in one of our bathrooms? Yes, um, we Part had a leak. Work. Yeah, yeah, we had a leak in um, behind one of the um, the urinals, and they had gotten rid of that. But. Hawthorne uh, water truck. Uh, this is on page uh, 14. Hawthorne, uh, we rent water trucks from them. On a, do we do that on a consistent basis? Or what do we do? What do we if, do? if I could address that, it was probably three years ago. The uh, water truck that we had, the tank that's on the back, we'd replaced it one time and the structural damp there was structural wear to the frame and it just wasn't worth the money to the district to buy a water truck that we use i don't want to say infrequently but not enough to justify a hundred and fifty thousand dollar purchase so whenever the construction has a job that they need a water truck they just actually run it for the day until we actually get back to needing it for a, a long-term purpose just out of curiosity i'm sure you thought of this but is there a way can co-op equipment like that with other water companies? Uh, we have whenever, we, in the past, people actually used to borrow ours. Oh. Uh, and <laughs> the other thing that we had was the fire department. We had an agreement with the fire department and fire. We actually operated our fire, water trucks on behalf of the fire department. Right. So it's actually, we used to provide service <laughs> to everybody else. Um, but it doesn't happen that frequently, so now we just rent the truck when we need it. Great, thank you. Uh, and then the last one, <laughs> is on page 15, it's a minor one, but just interesting to me, J.C. Ehrlich, plant rental. We rent plants? Yes, we do. Is that the plants we see in this building? Yes. They're all rented, so cared it, for it's, by them? It's rented, cared for, they water, they replace. If they go bad, they die, they bring new ones in. We have some upstairs as well. Thank you very much, those are all my questions, unless someone else has a question. There you go, I'm good. Thank you, John. Call for the vote. Call for the vote. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Action items. Next item uh, will be energy, energy management study presentation, which I believe. Uh, yes, I'll have um, James Gumpel actually address the board on this. This was, um, I mentioned several months ago that we were in the process of going through it. I believe when we did the um, presentation on the odor control study that James, no, Robert did the odor control study. This was a uh, energy management study that we took advantage of some sg e programs and um, then we expanded it and I'll turn it over to James. Uh, thank you, uh, President Martin, members of the board. Uh, the district started the energy management study uh, endeavor basically about three years ago. We took advantage of an sg e program to actually pay for the majority of the program. Uh, our consultant, uh, DHK Engineering, couldn't be here today. So as we go along, if there's any questions, uh, it's a fairly technical presentation, but I'll try and keep it uh, moving. Uh, but if there's any questions, I'll attempt to answer it. If there isn't, I'll have to get back to you once I confer with our consultant who couldn't make it today. Just a quick question here. Is it important for them to make a presentation on something they're doing? I mean, I know you'll do a fine job at it, but. Yeah, he tried to make it. Uh, the Originally, we had this scheduled in December. With the shifting of schedules, he couldn't make it. He had some family obligations, and then he had a conference that he was presenting on that was uh, a prior commitment that fell at the same time as this meeting. So. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, our main goals of the program was to evaluate the current energy profile of the district. What's our best management practices? Uh, how do we, uh, what are our facilities? Where do we use the energy? How do we use the energy and also when, basically? Uh, and look at the, both the rates and how much energy we're going to be consuming now and it's also later. And we looked at our water facilities, our recycled water facilities, our general uh, admi administration uh, facilities, which is right here. Uh, we have to evaluate and implement basically new practices where there may be one to look at, or is our current practices sufficient? We're answering those questions. And we need to make recommendations on how to move forward in the future, uh, and also show the future rates, you know, what's happening to the energy rates in the future, and how it's gonna affect uh, the water business, the sewer business, and also our rate payers. So, 
this was a program methodology, and it's, uh, I know it's pretty small, but I really wanted just to put it there so you could see um, it was fairly complicated. The important thing to take out of this is the majority of tasks one, two, and three were paid for by sg e through a grant. Uh, the district uh, took advantage, I believe it was at the uh, County Water Authority uh, Manager's meeting, uh, sg e did a presentation in which they had some grant funding available. After that, the district was first in line to take advantage of the grant funding. They were able to do about 90% of the cost of the study, but they really uh, kind of extended it out over a two, three year period. Uh, and then what they didn't allow was any forecasting of sdg &E rates. They wouldn't pay for that. So the district had to pick up that last piece to finish up the study because what the district was interested in is how is the future rates going to affect our customers? So getting into the study, basically what we looked at is our different facilities. We have our admin facility, we have our metal arc facility, and then we have both what we call uh, production, which is our water facility, and collections, which is our sewer facility. And we have our 2011 and 2012 energy costs. And what this shows you here is, on the bottom here is, you know, we spent $686,000 on energy in 11, and we spent 685,000 in 2012. Energy rates went up between 11 and 12. So majority of those savings happened at metal arc. Uh, and this is to be expected. Metal Arc's a fairly new plant with the expansion, and as uh, the operations gets a hold of the new facilities, there's efficiencies that they pick up on how to operate that plant. We don't expect to see this trend continue, however, because those are stuff that happens within the first uh, several years of a new plant coming on to, online. So how does that break down? As you see from the big red, Metal Arc is the primary consumer of energy here at the district. Uh, and then of course you have your water pump stations and that's to be expected. And then you got your sewer lift stations. And the only reason there's a disparity there is because we have a lot more water pump stations and sewer lift stations. And then in blue you can see our actual uh, admin facility here. So looking at that a little closer, uh, you can see the different facility costs between 2011 and 2012. Going across you can see the uh, larger savings here, which is the in metal arc. And that's the, the pick, pick up in efficiencies and operations that our staff was able to do on their own. And then let's talk about energy a little bit. Okay, so when people think about uh, electrical rates, it's just not kilowatts. Uh, there's really several components of it. We kind of categorize it into three main components. The red is the amount of electricity you use, the amount of kilowatts consumed. The yellow is when you consume it, you know, that peak period, that off-peak period, uh, that semi-peak period, and those are your charges. And the green is all the other stuff, you know, your taxes, your conveyance, those other fees that are always on your bill. And this is important because as we go through in this presentation, I'm going to have a nice chart that kind of summarizes everything uh, at DHK Engineering put together that shows you how the different tariffs move the red up, move the yellow down, and could provide an overall savings to the district. As far as uh, ECOs, Energy Conservation <coughs> Opportunities for the district, the uh, study looked at 45 different ECOs. Now, we're not gonna go through all 45 today. I'm gonna just hit on some of the highlights. <laughs> Sorry. So, some are just light bulbs. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are just LED bulbs. So. Um, so we have 19 here in the uh, administrative complex, 13 is operational, seven is maintenance, and then there's six capital. And we'll talk a little bit more about the six capital jobs because that is a, a decision that the district is gonna have to make um, <coughs> if we want to spend the money, what's the proper payback? So uh, with the report, with the phase one and the phase two, which was provided by scg &E, that provided the framework for the energy management study um, we identified, you know, how to manage, like, the second, third, fourth, and fifth bullet are all really about metal arc here. Uh, you know, how can we manage some of those peak demands, that yellow on that previous chart, <coughs> at metal arc. Also, we identified some capital improvements at the plant that could save some, uh, you know, 60,000 kilowatt hours per year. Um, and some other smaller savings, another $5,000 a year savings, and another $7,000 a year savings that's actually already been completed. And then there was a couple other uh, smaller uh, improvements that was uh, identified in the study as far as on our water pump station and also a larger one here replacing the existing chiller, uh, our you know, basically central plant here at the admin site. Uh, it was new and efficient at the time. 
technology has moved on, and now that is considered by today's standards fairly inefficient. James, uh, if you wouldn't mind, I don't know if you touch on peak, off peak, and semi peak yes. in an explanation. Yes, uh, okay. really quick, uh, yeah. Uh, as far as the demand charges, uh, you have peak rates, which are primarily during business hours. Uh, semi peak is on the fringes on both sides, and off peak is usually weekends and nights for, for a simple explanation. And actually, uh, we're going to go through in a couple slides here how SCGE has, has really changed the rules on when peak is, when semi peak is, and how they're changing that, and how it's also going to affect both the district and our rate payers. James, let me ask you a question. On, on the replacement of the central plant, the building is how old? Uh, 17 years. Mm -hmm. Well, from the time we built it and conditioned it, I'd say 16 years. And uh, by putting in a other than for mechanical reasons, by putting in a new chiller, how many years is that going to take to pay off in electric costs? Well, that's what we have to evaluate. And one of the questions that the uh, study left blank is it's really going to be a, a district you know, decision on where that payback is, whether we want to look at five years, 10 years, 15 years from payback, or look at it from an individual standpoint. Uh, the study really couldn't pinpoint that out because there's certain industries where the technology is advancing pretty rapidly and may not make sense to jump in because you know two, three years down the line, there's something that would be better that could give you a quicker payback and you'd be replacing what you just replaced. Uh, and then there's other things, uh, you know, as far as pump stations, motors, pipeline, reservoir sizing that are, are really more defined where we can sit down and say, if we make a pump bigger, we can save this much, but it's going to cost X amount of dollars. And, you know, the really at the end of the day is what makes sense in the district. And it's something that we're going to have to vet out during the master plan process when we look at our design standards. And, and part of the problem with the one we have, it's not supported anymore from a manufacturer standpoint. So getting parts and when it does break down, it puts the entire complex out of, out of service. Thank you. So that was a great segue because what has changed in the last really year, year and a half with the scg &E, uh, rates. What's scg &E doing and how does it affect us? Well, here's basically the highlights. Uh, they're extending the summer period. And what does that mean? Well, it, ultimately by 2018, the summer pumping period, which is has a shorter off-peak, larger peak period, is going to match daylight savings. So starting next year, 2015, they move it up a month. And then by 2018, it's going to match um, daylight savings, which gives you only four months, I believe, out of 12 months of winter pumping rates as for where you have a larger off-peak and a smaller peak. So they just basically flipped it. And the next three, four slides all kind of coincide with each other. They've also increased the demand components. So when we looked at those different rate schedules, where we showed you the yellow and the red and the different components, they're, what they're doing is they're bringing up. So if you pump during the peak periods, they're really going to hammer you. If you pump during semi-peak, the rate's going up significantly. So if you peak, pump during that off-peak, you get rewarded. But that off-peak now window has gotten really small. Okay? Uh, the next thing they've done is they've, they're going to realign those costs. So they're going to realign how they do the different peak and the non-coincidental. Basically, they're going to realign between the different type of rates they have. And we'll get into the different rate structures that are available for uh, most water agencies. Uh, where it doesn't matter which rate you pick, they're going to collect about the same amount of dollars. Uh, and of course, they're, they're also realigning the PAT1 rate. The PAT1, uh, I think, uh, you know, some people call it the ag rate. And they're basically going to make that uh, basically non, not advantageous to have in the future. They're going to basically bring it to the point where having that rate is going to cost you more money. What does PAT stand for? Um, I don't know, Tom, do you remember? Yeah, okay. it's, agri it's an agricultural rate. Yeah. The A stands okay. for agricult agriculture. Okay. So it's, it's an ag rate. I don't remember what the P and the T stand for. Okay. And then uh, a couple other things that affects everybody <coughs> is uh, sug &E had to adopt its new renewable portfolio standard. Uh, what that means is a certain percentage of the energy they produce has to be renewable energy sources. If they don't have it, they need to go pay somebody else for their renewable energy credits. Uh, so that's going to basically increase the cost of the base electricity. Uh, the other thing is the AB 32, Assembly Bill 32, which is the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. Uh, all 
everybody has to comply with that within their within their facilities. Of, of course, the energy producing companies like SEGME, they have a big component in that. Uh, that's going to add an additional layer of taxes and fees because they'll have to go out and actually purchase additional greenhouse credits to offset the energy that they're producing and greenhouse gases that they're producing. Uh, and to, to kind of go in hand with that, uh, the decommissioning of San Onofre. Believe it or not, San Onofre is a nuclear uh, a power plant that is considered a renewable energy source. It also produces a significant amount of electricity for this region. So what you have now is more energy being uh, imported from outside, and you have this big renewable energy source that is no longer available. So they have to go out and purchase or create new renewable energy sources to meet with their uh, the previous two bullets, their AB32 and also their new uh, renewable portfolio. And while this is all happening, natural gas is very cheap. Electricity is very high, so there's natural inflationary forces on natural gas that's predicted to bring natural gas prices up considerably. So, all great news. <laughs> what I said. <laughs> so, what does this mean to us? Well, we looked at our master plan projections from our 2008 master plan, and we looked at two different time steps. Uh, the current time step, which was in 2012 when we uh, looked at the data in the study, and the 2020 and 2030 time steps, and we looked at how much we'd be pumping, improvements that are shown in the master plan to increase our pumping capacity, to figure out, based on our current operational standards, how much more are we going to be pumping into that peak period, to that semi-peak period, and how much more money will that cost both the district and our ratepayers? So we looked at the water facilities, we looked at the wastewater facilities in the same time step, and then we, we basically used this with also future energy projections as we talked about the different time steps between the summer rate, daylight savings, uh, our current operational characteristics, <coughs> try to anticipate how we would change in the future, you know, as far as putting in new pumps that's already in the master plan for <coughs> upgrades of our pump stations. And then we had to create an energy uh, model. So our consultant created an energy model, and, and these are basically the assumptions. I'm not gonna go over every assumption that they put in. There's escalations of fees, there's the escalations in the demand charges, uh, you know, extra fees from the decommissioning of the nuclear power plant. And of course, we already talked about those peak rates and the summertime rates. Um, so with that, here's a great uh, kind of illustration of what that means. It's kind of an average of our pump stations and our lift stations. So down here on the red line, that's where we are, uh, in, <coughs> at least in 2012. Yeah, that's that PAT1, that ag rate. And as we move along, you can see between them uh, realigning the demand charges of the PAT1 up here, uh, circling for you guys and then also the extending one month summer period what that does to the rate it jumps up considerably okay and then as we move forward they continue the realignment and then you have another uh, several months that are added to that summer period that red line ends up crossing at some point and ends up being the higher rate so that PAT1 is basically going to be a dinosaur here sooner or later. It's going to be a rate that's not advantageous for any district to have. And at one point it's going to make sense to jump over to the PA rate, which is just a standard rate, or D. And then sooner or later, as you move back out on the curve, uh, if everything stays the same, obviously, uh, it'd be more advantageous to do to a time use, the TLU is time use rate, uh, which is more of what you know your homes are on, the average resident residential would be on a, a, TO, a TLU rate. So this is a great illustration that kind of shows you over time what SCG&E's new rules, how they affect the water industry, and, and in fact will increase the amount of an average pump station from $60,000 to just here when they do their final rule changes in 2018, we're getting $115,000 between that. Now there is some increased pumping there, so it's not a pure uh, rate change. We're also pumping more water, delivering more water in that time. But you can see the rate goes up significantly. And then the rest of this, as it goes out, because we don't know about any other rule changes beyond that, is really just increased pumping and increased escalation, of, you know, normal escalation at 1.2% to 1.5% uh, escalation as time moves on. So we took that great information and we started looking at our facilities. So it started with the water facilities here. Actually, sorry, this is all the facilities. And we said, okay, if you don't do any of the energy conservation measures, uh, those opportunities, you're gonna spend 
$1.7 million in energy costs by 2020, and that will go up to $3.2 million and change by 2030. If you do those costs, you could potentially save $281,000 by 2020, and by 2030, that would move up to $338,000 and change. So, uh, and to try and put some real numbers in it. Basically, I know this table is a little hard to read on your, on your scale, but what we did here is the first two bars are really uh, the current, which is at this time 2012, next two are 2020, and then 2030. And you can see at each facility how the cost of energy goes up and where the minor differences are in savings. Uh, so you have basically, if you look on the board, you have the current and there's no savings here and then well this is a bad one here i'll pick this one <laughs> current and if you made a change now to a different rate because that pa that red line that in that chart that we showed earlier uh is much lower so it doesn't make sense to make that change and then you have the next one and then of course you have a little savings and then by 2030 you, you see a larger savings so so most of the savings are unfortunately from the rate changes uh, when SDG&E went ahead and uh, basically in, initiated the new rule changes, a lot of the savings that was available between you know, changing out lights, doing high efficiency motors, that was gone. Also, looking at our current best management practices, the district already puts in high efficiency motors, has already done a good job with uh, the current best management practices. So there wasn't a lot of opportunities uh, to save, which is a good thing in one way, because uh, we basically have, have already put in most of the savings that we can and we've built into it. Uh, so wastewater projection, this one's a little easier to see because there's less uh, wastewater facilities to look at, but it's the same thing here. You have your, your, your current, your 2020, and your 2030 projections without doing anything and with uh, obviously implementing any uh, energy conservation measures. So, looking at that as savings per million gallons. So, you have your different facilities here. Uh, you have your 2020 and 2030 estimates, and really, the last column is the delta. You know, for example, here at Deer Springs Pump Station, you save $56 per million gallons. Okay, so these aren't huge numbers, but these are savings we're looking at. And Metal Arc Hydro, it's $110 per million gallons pumped. What does that mean for our customers? Well. Next table here is the same basic table, but it's dollars per unit cost. So you're looking at really a, a somewhere between one dollar and three to four dollars for average household in savings on the energy portion of the cost. And this is just energy we're talking about. So uh, we had this table drafted earlier prior to the rule changes, and the numbers were almost triple. But with the rule, but with the rule changes again, when they realign those rates they took the, any advantages out of the system to basically collect about the same amount no matter where you go. So future energy conservation and sustainability guidelines. So for all facilities, uh, the district needs to monitor when to switch over to those new rates. Uh, get off that PAT rate, that ag rate, go over to the time of use rate. And it'll happen at different times for different facilities depending on how much we're pumping, what that facility is. Uh, continue to install premium efficiency motors. Uh, obviously, premium lighting, LED lighting, uh, as the rates go up, having the higher class lighting will end up paying dividends and have quicker payback. Um, assume for our design standards in our next master plan that instead of using a off-peak and semi-peak on ag rate pumping, assume a time of use on designing of facilities. And this does have a trickle-down effect because it potentially makes our pump stations bigger, our pipelines larger, and our reservoirs larger. So we have to balance that with water quality concerns because if you make a facility too big, you have too much retention time there and there's water quality <coughs> concerns. So there will have to be a balance between the dollars to put larger facilities in, the water quality concerns, and of course, not only maintenance, but the um, operational costs of that pump station and facility. Um, Update our strategic plan and energy, and energy projections on a three-year cycle. Uh, monitor the uh, development of any new technology. And, and this is a, a large area of potential uh, in different avenues, whether it's pumps, motors. There's a large potential for new technology to help cut into those savings. 
uh, incorporate energy management component as part of tools for retrofit designs, look at existing facilities, where does it make sense? We're probably not going to be ripping out existing pipes and ripping out existing tanks to build larger tanks. So what can we do to help mitigate any uh, energy escalations on existing facilities? Uh, develop an energy conservation opportunity implementation policy. So where's the payback? Is it a five year payback? Is it a 10 year payback? What makes sense? And uh, continue to track any advantages and grants from the uh, SDG or outside sources. With that, if you look at the distribution system, you're gonna be looking at transmission mains. Do we make our mains larger to limit the amount of friction loss during pumping? Do we make our reservoirs lot larger? Again, do we have concerns with water quality, operational concerns to weigh against just building a large tank and sticking it on top of the hill? Uh, and also, we need to minimize our pump station use now. So that you're talking about larger pumps, larger pump station that runs for less hours a day. And at some point, that's not gonna make sense. So we have to t balance that in our next master plan criteria to see where that line is, where does it make sense? And of course, we need to implement this in a CIP orderly. Sir? Can you give me an idea of, with the increase of the reservoir size, how that would benefit the electrical uh, component? Sure. Uh, so you're basically slugging more water into a reservoir during a shorter period. And then the reservoir now doesn't have an opportunity, unless you want to pump during the high peak time to get recharged. So the reservoir has to hold more volume to allow a longer view. So if you're only pumping four to six hours a day, and then the rest of the time in a 24-hour day, the reservoir is draining. So you need more volume up there to, to hold that for right. operation. And then, and then the same thing happens with the pump. <clears throat> if we know we have to pump a million gallons, and we used to have seven hours, now we only have three hours. Well, you still got to get the same amount of water to this yeah. tank, mm -hmm. which means you got a bigger pipe and a much larger pump station. So it's, it's a tough balancing act. Uh, and, and a lot of these, depending on the payback, you know, is not going to make sense. Uh, you, unfortunately, you have whole systems designed around off-peak and semi-peak pumping that are already in place all over the county. And you know, it, I wouldn't think it would make sense to rip out those systems and, and put in brand new systems to meet with the new, new reality that we're facing now. Uh, and Metalark. Uh, Metalark is our biggest energy uh, consumer at the district as far as a single facility. Uh, so we need to incorporate a, a, a demand management plan. Well, Metalark is a sewer treatment plant, sewer is on demand, so there's very little we can do. But looking at where we could pick up opportunities is maybe where we have a lot of pumps that start on, start off. Best way to be explained to me by our consulting is when a pump starts, there's an inrush current, kind of like when you crank over a car, it takes a lot more energy to get that engine started. There's an inrush current, and the more times the pump starts, it stops and starts within a, a period of time, the more energy it uses. So maybe looking at larger wet wells, so this way the, a pump could run longer bef between stops and starts. Expanding at our chlorine contact chamber, that's what the CCT is. And that have two advantages. It would allow our reclaimed water pumps to run longer periods at a slower rate, but also it would allow the metal art treatment plant to actually produce more recycled water potentially. Um, and also fine tune our bio tower and aeration basins operation, and that's already in process or partially completed. Um, as far as the district headquarters, as mentioned before, the main component was replacing the existing Kauri tile chiller. And as far as the next steps, uh, really is defining that payback structure. What makes sense? Is it five years, 10 years? Is it something that we're gonna be looking at in the master plan, uh, talking about with management, and also looking at the master plan design criteria. The design criteria is gonna have to change, uh, maybe not significantly, but we're gonna have to look at it in the master plan cycle to, for what's best for the district as far as for you know, both water quality, operational, and also, uh, you know, uh, cost standpoint. Also, how do we want to implement these energy conservation opportunities, these ECOs, uh, you know, on a timely manner? Where do we implement them within the CIP? Track the energy structure annually uh, for each facility to see when is the right time to jump over from that ag rate to either the PA or the time of use rate and revisit that payback every master plan cycle. Technology changes, uh, sdg &E rates and tariffs may change, and it'll be an opportunity to see if, if our design criteria, need, bright criteria needs to be revisited and update the strategic plan. Uh, with that, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions for you, uh, and of course I'd be happy to get back to the general manager to answer any questions through our consultant uh, that I may not be able to. 
Dr. Hernandez? Uh, yes, a, a couple of things. Dennis, I recall in one of our journeys uh, around the district, we were looking at putting in a hydro pump uh, to generate power in the transmission line in Twin Oaks Valley. And I know that was a process that had to do with the state and yada yada. Can you give me an update on what yeah, that's Yeah, I was just actually discussing that with uh, Director Martin yesterday. James is probably the most current update, and I know Ed's got some information on that as well. Yeah, actually, uh, I was going to say, Ed's done the most research on that. I know oh, that good. there's some avenues We always like to hear from Ed. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we are working with. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. When you step up to the microphone for the TV, also your name and your title. Uh, Ed Pedrazzi, Water Operations Supervisor. Uh, Director Hernandez, we are working with a consultant right now to see if it's feasible for us and cost effective to put in a, a hydroelectric generation system at Trussell Flow Control Facility, which is on Twin Oaks. Um, it's looking good. Uh, one of the hiccups would have been the cost would have been about $10,000 permit. Uh, to put it there, uh, but Congress recently passed uh, an act, a law that will waive that for small plants like this one. Oh, um, one thing that we're looking at right now is to make sure that this uh, generator will also work in reverse as a pump. So when we're bringing the desal water in in the winter time and we don't have enough demand downtown, we can move that water up north into our big Twin Oaks reservoirs and store it up there. Hmm. So we're in process right now of, of determining what we can and can't do. Okay, uh, and um, uh, that begs the question, and I know we had the grant uh, to do the solar panels out here in the uh, maintenance yard, but, um, I, and I can't recall, it seems to me that there was a, a, a lawsuit relative to uh, sdg e charging some kind of a tariff for, for municipal and commercial uses, but I think that got overturned. Where we stood on, there were two issues to that. One was the approach of sdg e um, because they're part of the, what James spoke about is part of their portfolio, they have to have a certain percentage of solar power. Mm -hmm. The way stg &E looked at it and what they filed with the CPEC was that they said, okay, we've met our percentage of solar power. Uh, so the North County Coalition, then we got some San Diego schools got together and we took them back to the PC. And the ruling was no, the, the guidance has to be a statewide mandate on solar power. So sdg &E couldn't say they reached theirs, now everybody else do yours. So that one was overruled. The other one that they're going through, and we just have, we're hoping to get the final decision from the, I guess it's an administrative judge for CPC, is we uh, continue this process with this group. And what sdg &E did was they basically took the unit or commodity charge and said, okay, we're, we're not getting that in because nobody's using power anymore. So they wanted to take what was a commodity charge, roll it into a fixed cost. So no matter if you pump during the day, at night, or any time, it didn't matter. You're going to pay a higher rate, which is the whole conversation that James just had. That decision uh, was that came down, I want to say it was two and a half, three weeks ago, favorable to the coalition. Uh, they had, I think it was a 30-day period to challenge it, which I believe is up sometime in January. So far, they have not filed an appeal to challenge the decision. So that would be favorable to us to where they can't move all their costs from commodity into a fixed. So that will actually benefit us. So then that would allow us to at least put solar panels into the equation of whether that's a We'll look at it now that they've made that choice. Twin Oaks is obviously a great site. Mm -hmm. We've got, I don't know how many acres per tank. Yeah, of just guess. flat land out there. Yeah. When we started looking at it several years ago, this evolution was starting to change. And they're called a power purchase agreement uh, to where a private contractor would come in, they would develop it, they pay for it, and the way they get their money is they get the credit for the full development and they give you a guaranteed cost per kilowatt hour for a certain time period. So if SDG &E goes from 11 to 16, we might be guaranteed 12. That's where the savings comes in, that's where they make their money. And then my last question was <clears throat> with all the changes to uh, of the rates and the times and all that, uh, did we or our industry uh, have a say with the PUC that this was, you know, sending money the wrong direction? We tried. We were part of it. Um, that was part of the second lawsuit or thing that we pursued. Because, like James is indicating, we <clears throat> how to describe it? Because we have such a huge demand on the power system around the clock. Yeah. Sewers never stopping. We. We just can't tell people to quit going to the bathroom at seven at night. 
Um, but the water, what would happen is we as an industry would do all of our pumping at night as off peak. Well, what that did to STG and all the power providers, that gave them a guaranteed demand at night so they didn't have to shut their plants down, they didn't have to back off and not produce as much power. So if what they're going to do is just generate this fixed cost, well, fine. If it's not going to make a difference when we pump, well, then James can run a pump 14 hours a day, not three hours a day, mm -hmm. and make it a lot smaller, and we'll just run it all day. Then they have to actually generate that much more power. So it was kind of a compromise to where they ended up coming down to. We all still didn't agree with it. You all know how much California pays for power, for water. You know, it's a huge percentage. And that was part of the lawsuit where we took it. They did get some of the variations they asked, mm -hmm. which is what James is talking about, but they didn't get all of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, question, uh, Mr. Hernandez's first question. You said something about a permit that was expensive, but now Congress says, what kind of permit and who are you paying for? Yes, uh, Federal for Energy. Federal Energy. Regulatory Commission. Yeah. That's what it stands for. Uh, yeah, there was a $10,000 fee for a permit for every single site. It wasn't just one because we've actually looked at potentially three different sites where we could generate electricity using the flow of water that we have every day. So a $30,000 permit fee meant it wasn't going to be worth it at all. Even the 10000 for one was pretty iffy. So. Uh, we kind of held back until it uh, went through Congress, and they actually moved it through pretty quick. And so now that fee is no longer an issue, and so we're still working with the consultants now to see just how much power we can produce. Uh, we don't flow constantly through that uh, flow control facility, so that we kind of go up and down. We have to work with sdg and &E. um, I have an email to them to find out if they even have the right kind of power on that section of the grid in front of our station. So it has to be three-phase power available. I'm pretty sure they do because Twin Oaks is a main thoroughfare, but I haven't received anything back from them. Uh, and I have a couple of questions. Is, is James, we do this, uh, uh, how often is the criteria, master plan cycle? Uh, well, for the energy management study, it's, I don't know when the last time we've done one is. But that was going to be my next question. Yeah. When was the last time we were working <laughs> on it? And how accurate has it proven or not proven to be? Yeah. One of the things is energy has been always a really minor component. It was never really a major component of, of the building rates as far as, uh, it, it, you know, energy's been cheap overall in history here. And the recent change in the, basically, the forecasting and the, the new reality of what's happening with the electricity rates made it more necessary to really look at this thing from a holistic point of view. Uh, design criteria has been, always been looked at each master plan cycle, which is roughly five years. Uh, and we've always looked at that with uh, an eye for efficiency, operations, and serviceability. You know, what is the best criteria to get basically best paying for the buck on new facilities? Uh, but this energy component specifically is really new. And besides the gray Davis areas where energy was uh, deregulated and went crazy for a bit, really energy rates have been really low and fairly steady. But what's come out now with the new PUC rulings and the new uh, SEG new rule changes is it's going to be a, a more significant portion of the water rate, unfortunately. Yeah, what we used to actually do it on an annual basis. We would look at each facility to see what the new tariffs were, and we would modify every year. John used to handle that on our behalf, so we'd look. But what we never did was try to see what it was 20 and 30 years because we weren't concerned. It was three cents a kilowatt hour. It was a very small piece. Now we're at 12 and it's projected to go a lot bigger. So this is the first of many. First fully comprehensive. So we don't really, can't really look back at the last one. No. See how well we This did. is the first one of many. And what was the cost? For us? Without you. Uh, for the whole study, uh, SDG&E picked up almost the whole cost except for uh, DHK engineering for the final portion, putting it all together, it was under $30,000. And how long did this? The sg &E portion took almost uh, three years, and we pulled the last portion together <clears throat> in about four months. Thank you. Well, uh, I think it's uh, you know kind of our fiscal responsibility to do a study because we, we kind of like to see where you are. Even though you have year, yearly or monthly or quarterly conversations with your sdg &E rep, they, it's still difficult to figure out in the end. Kind of reminds me of that workshop where a speaker we had at the uh, uh, water utilities talking about uh, uh, water actually being the leading edge 
of, of, in, of uh, energy use. So it's kind of it's kind of flippant. We're yeah. seeing where that's happening, but nobody's really recognizing that. Um, I'm not really seeing anything new here, and, and basically it's because you guys do such a great job any time that you're refurbishing, whether you're uh, replacing a pump, uh, whether you're uh, reconditioning a whole plant. These are the things that you're looking for, is things that are energy efficient, everything from your variable frequency drives, the high efficiency motors, and things of that nature. So, uh, and, and what you're talking about here as far as the, the central plant for this building, it's just common sense because you're 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 looking at frequency of repair, what's costing you to run it, and then life cycle cost, and bang, you're right there anyway. So, when it becomes a, a big enough pain, you'll do it, and then you'll have something that's really high efficient. But, but it's always good to know because uh, as you're going out doing the onesie twosie things, uh, which may be everything from parking lot lights to bathroom lighting, uh, you 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 know where. Uh, where it is you can make the change you can have that list in your back pocket and you know when it's good to go out and change them over to leds from from where they are now so um in in the part you were talking about which gets in there kind of micromanaging which is uh micromanaging your energy use uh, has been suggested to me as well and it's very difficult to do because it's it, you're talking about your startup amps what it takes to start up your your motors and then not having them all start at the same time. So you're kind of staggering that. that that's going to depend on your demand. Or they're going to tell you to start shaving those during your high, your high, your high peak performance time or uh, cost time. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's quite a bit of managing your, uh, uh, your energy uh, uh, systems. So it's kind of micromanaging. Anyway, I, I think you did a real good job on the report. And I think it's something you've got to do every year regardless. Thank you. And uh, one thing to point out, our consultant, uh, DHK Engineering, was the consultant for SGG that did several agencies. And uh, he wouldn't give me the agency's names, but he said some of the other agencies that don't have established design criteria saw huge savings, even with the new tariffs. But it also, a company with a humongous capital uh, investment to replace the existing infrastructure that was missized pump systems that were not uh, adequately sized. Uh, so with us, the, the infrastructure changes were nil to none uh, because of the current design criteria that we have in place uh, and, and also the, the fact that our system is fairly new. Right. I would just like to compliment staff and the board before for taking this on because I know even with the County Water Authority, they say how this is becoming an issue in a lot of districts weren't expecting it. Like you said, they weren't prepared for it. So compliment the, uh, on the report. Very well done. I'm sorry DHK wasn't here, but you did an excellent job. And Thank you. You'll, you'll actually probably be hearing from Don in a little while because he's also doing an odor and a noise study down at Meadowark. Oh, okay. To, further update that of what's going on down the street. But an example of what Jim was just talking about, we hear that end brush of the demand. You've all been to Meadowlark in the, the um, what do we call it, Brutus? The generator that's down there? It's a one, what is it? Hercules. 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 It's a one point something megawatt generator. It is just massive. But when it runs, it only uses 15, 20% of its power. The bulk of it is it has to be able to start everything in that plant up at once. And it's that end rush that just kills you. So I mean, the thing sits there empty, not even full power most of the time, but what are you gonna do? Thank you, James. It's an interesting industry right now, isn't it? Yeah. Another it's question. Changing. Thank you, James. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Is it a note and file? Yes, just the information next, at this point. Next item is another note and file. This will be financial dashboard presentation. And I'll have Steve come up and talk, let yeah. Tom introduce this. And yeah, this is a presentation on dashboard. The dashboard's a term that's thrown around and probably a little understood, and, and uh, Director Podal and Director Hernandez were exposed to what Encina Wastewater Authority were doing in their board packet. They presented reports and called them dashboard. Uh, but what Steve uh, brings a, a lot of knowledge to, the, to our district, Steve Woso is our new finance analyst, and we also have a new application specialist, Thomas Baer, and, and both are very versed in dashboard, and I've learned a lot from them recently, and Steve's going to present and, and fill you in on what we're doing with uh, dashboard. Take it away, Steve. All right. Good afternoon. Um, as, Tom, as Tom said, I'll be going over um, something that I'm working on right now. I've been with the district about two months. I met most of you uh, uh, at the 
meeting a couple of months ago. So what, one thing that I have been working on and will be working on uh, is this dashboard project. And it sort of uh, evolved out of a couple of issues that were noticed. Uh, one of them being that a lot there's a lot of uh, critical data uh, in the district systems that can be found in multiple locations. And often it's challenging to get at a lot, some of this information uh, being that it's often spread across <coughs> different systems. Uh, there's the other, uh, another issue would be that some of these uh, pieces of information may have multiple sources and you could have people maintaining different uh, pieces of information for their own needs and because of that sometimes you may have different, um, different results depending upon who's doing it, depending upon their own needs for things that uh, you know, ideally they should have one answer. Uh, the last piece, the last item would be what we would call the silo effect, and basically by that, what I mean is the uh, natural inclination for information to become compartmentalized, so that you have uh, different departments uh, within the uh, utility, sort of. Um, uh, I don't want to say hoarding information, but sort of, uh, you know, being used to the information they use on a daily basis, and. Uh, whereas uh, other departments may want to be able to access in this information easily, uh, it's not as easy to do for them uh, because they don't work on it on a daily basis. And um, people have a tendency to sort of uh, protect their information, things that they do on a daily basis. Uh, what we have on the chart on the slide here, uh, at the bottom of the slide here, are four systems uh, currently used by different departments to, to do our work here. Uh, the first one there is GEMS, which is the accounting and payroll uh, software package. Uh, the next one is the GIS, it was actually a collection of software packages, the GIS, Geographic Information Systems, used for mapping and uh, uh, keeping track of the service areas of the uh, district. Uh, the third one is North Star, which is used for uh, customer billing. And the last one is Maximo, which is our uh, asset management system. And these are some of the packages that we use to do our uh, um, departments to do their work. And as you can see, they're sort of all on one level, but they're sort of separate from each other. And so that sort of becomes an issue uh, when uh, trying to access some of this information across different departments and whatnot. So the solution for this would be to develop a definitive centralized location to examine key operational and financial data to facilitate decision making. So basically what that means is the dashboard, as Tom was saying, and so, so rather than having something that looks like this, you have another layer on top of these four systems called the dashboard, which is used to access some of this information, and it sort of creates a, uh, um, you know, an authoritative location where you know that if something is found here, that's the correct answer. So if you want to find out how many miles of pipe there is, for example, you know where to go, you know, you know that when you get it, this is going to be the correct answer. Uh, whereas you know, now, depending upon where you get the information from, some of the information may be dated. Uh, and uh, so this is the idea behind this is easy access and always uh, you know, at your fingertips and uh, you know, knowing that it's correct. So uh, to back up a second, uh, uh, the dashboard, to give you an idea of what it is, because uh, you know, it is sort of a bit of a buzzword, uh, and uh, it ha has a lot of different meanings, and people use it differently. Uh, in our term, and for our purposes here, essentially, uh, the dashboard would allow the operator or the user to examine the various uh, um, uh, items, the data in the system, via charts and tables. Uh, it'll allow the user to examine the information over various time periods so you can look at historical information and to the extent that there's any sort of forecasts available for future information uh, that could possibly be in there as well. Uh, and it's useful, of course, for developing these forecasts. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, it would serve as an uh, authoritative uh, uh, repository for crucial information. So where we are in the process at this point in time, uh, very, very early in the process, uh, it's uh, basically just sort of starting to get off the ground with, the, uh, uh, with myself and Thomas, who is the application specialist coming on board. 
Um, it, uh, basically, where we're at right now is we're sort of examining the alternatives. Uh, one option would be to develop it 100% internally. Um, the idea with that is that somebody you know, on staff would build it and maintain it. Um, and the other option would be to purchase dashboard software, pa uh, dashboard software package. Now, there pr there's pros and cons associated with each one of those options. Um, if you were to develop it internally, you're talking about uh, and you know to build it and to maintain it. Essentially, you're talking about have that would be uh, one person, one staff member's full-time job. That would be all they would do. Uh, the other option would be to purchase it, uh, the software package. You know, there's a lot of different packages out there. We're examining them right now, and many of these uh, packages, you know, they've already done the legwork of building the the tools that you can use. So. Given that we're more interested in using dashboards rather than becoming dashboard building experts, um, most likely the, uh, um, the option to purchase a dashboard software package would be where we would want to go. However, we are, we are still exploring uh, uh, these two options. So once we decide on a uh, method there in terms of how we're going to go about doing this, whether or not we build it internally or we uh, uh, go with a software package, uh, uh, existing software package. The uh, this uh, this chart, this table here, uh, sh sorry, the slide here sort of gives you an idea of the next steps that would be involved in that. So you're going to want to identify the various users of the dashboards uh, across the different departments. Um, you're going to want to identify the information that will be contained on the dashboards, and for the different departments, this may be uh, there will be different uh, needs and different. Uh, data items for the different uh, users of the dashboards. So for example, uh, a couple of the items that we're currently interested in right now would be meter additions, uh, water production and sales, uh, usage, uh, water consumption per meter, and reserve balances, for example. Especially those first three items, we spend a lot of time, uh, not a lot of time, but we spend enough time uh, compiling that information and maintaining that information. And uh, it would be useful to have a uh, way to sort of slice and dice that material any way we want and uh, have that information readily available for various uh, uh, various needs. Uh, Tom and I just worked on something today where uh, uh, this uh, it would be very useful to create uh, to have this available a report we filled out for the County Water Authority uh, that was very useful and uh, would be very useful to help prepare that report for them. Uh, so the next item would be to validate the data and the source for each item. So you want to make sure that you know that what you're, what's coming into the dashboard is the correct piece of information for that item. Um, you would then move forward with designing query options. You know, how do we want to slice and dice this data? Do we want to, you know, look at it by year? For example, if we're looking at customer accounts, we're gonna, we're probably gonna want to look at it by meter sizes. We're gonna look at it by customer class. Uh, so on and so forth, perhaps elevations, uh, different elevations that, uh, um, you know, that you want to decide ahead of time how you're going to examine these, uh, uh, these items. And then the next step would be to de design the dashboard output, output, which typically takes place in the forms of uh, uh, charts and tables. And lastly, I will kind of give you a, uh, just kind of an overview of what the, uh, what we call a da Excel dashboard concept. So basically we built, we sort of uh, built a dummy dashboard in Excel just to kind of give you a feel for how something like this would work. Obviously it's not gonna look exactly like this, but the general idea is we wanna show you uh, potentially what, uh, what the idea behind it is. So you're gonna have a, you know, this dashboard where you have one sort of like a home page where you're gonna have the different options for, to look at different things. So this dashboard, for example, would have information on meters, water sales, water production, and usage uh, per meter. So you could go to, let's say you wanted to get some information on meters, uh, you would click on the meters uh, item there, and it may be kind of hard to read because of the screen resolution, but uh, you, have, uh, you have a menu up the top that will allow you to query the ver uh, data in different ways, so you could look at it, for example, uh, the number of meters by fiscal year, so by clicking on the different buttons, it will take you to the different uh, different uh, charts available and the different tables available. So here, for example, we're looking at uh, meters by the fiscal year. Okay, well, let's say we want to look at it by 
uh, meters, meter additions by fiscal year. So you could uh, have the same information. It's basically derived from the same information, but you're uh, compiling, looking at it in different ways. You also have the option to, um, for example, let's say you want to look at a 12-month period ending, say, uh, you know, June 30th, which would be the end of the last uh, fiscal year. So you can look at uh, total meters, um, look at them by size, by customer class or meter additions. And so the point, uh, uh, the point of all this is you want to have the ability to, um, you know, you have all of this information across the various departments and the various systems um, that are used each day to do our jobs. And it would be extremely helpful to have uh, uh, access a lot of this information much faster and uh, much more confidently that you would know that, okay, when I go here and I pull up this number, I know that that's what I need and I know that that's the uh, right piece of information. There's a few other options here, um, a few other tables here that we have here, but uh, essentially it's uh, uh, basically the same idea where you can access uh, different pieces of information. You can query it in different ways, look at it in different ways. Um, and that's about it. If there's any questions, I will do my best. Yes. I, I have a couple of questions. Of course. And I don't know if you'll be answering them or General Manager Lane will be answering them. But let me ask you, is this a, a totally a, a for um, transparency? Is this for uh, interior departments only? Uh, it could this be information for, for. Yeah, it could be for transparency. Um, initially, I think the idea is it would be a... Uh, uh, an internal product used to help everyone do their jobs more efficiently. Internal. Um, internally, uh, uh, initially. But for um, reporting as well, so yeah. reports are consistent. Yes. We're, we're, like and Steve said, assistant we're, general manager Tom. <laughs> yes, we're, we're validating the data before we report on it, and if engineering is doing a report, it looks consistent to finances report. And, uh, well, internally I understand it, but externally some of this information you can't give out. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it shouldn't give out. Yeah, sure. ex externally, Director Martin, what the, the long-term goal here would be with the new website would be to, to allow a portal, lack of better terms. Uh, if a resident wants to just see how many meters do we have, we can have that information by year. How much water do we use? What's the consumption per person? Because, you know, we have the 20 by 2020 we have to track. That's going to become a very big issue over the next few years. Uh, so it's basically a way to deal with the... Uh, myriad of information that we generate on a daily basis. The, the meter reads, uh, now because of the meter reads with the new iPearl, it actually generates a hourly read if we need it for analysis. Um, it, it's just a way to, it's a, it's a best management practice, would be probably the best way to look at it. Yeah, I guess I understand that, uh, yeah. I understand especially for transparency with the right. information you can give out. But I've only been on the board a year, but nobody's asked me how many miles of water pipe do you have, how many miles of sewer pipe do you have, yeah. how many meters do you have. No one in my other job was longer asked me how many miles of roadway are there, how many traffic lights are there. I mean, I just, you know, internally I can understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and that's what the bulk of it is, so right. that when we do it, like I was, I was explaining to Steve when he's putting the dashboard together, I'll get a lot of surveys, Tom will do them. Um, we look at everything from when the HR does um, the staffing plan. You may recall at the beginning of last year we did the five-year staffing projection. The five-year staffing projection is based upon a historical how much growth we've had. And then the way HR and the staffing study looks at, they'll, they'll do, uh, they call them metrics. They will compare how many miles of pipe we have per person per size. Then we look at that to a standard of AWWA. So it's basically taking that number so it's always the same. And I might be doing a study and I'll say, oh, I had 300 miles of pipe written down on my note here. I'll call GIS, how many miles of pipe do we have? Uh, 275. Well, we lost 25 miles of pipe, where'd it go? Oh, let me get back to you. Now we have 310. It's that thing just to make sure we have consistent control over all the stuff we do. Thank you. I think it's a, thank you. I think it's um, an excellent idea. Uh, if, so if I understand you right, all the departments will access to the dashboard when they're seeking information. Y correct, it would be. Even though they may choose to keep something in a different way for some other use that everybody doesn't use in their department, they can st would still all use the dashboard as the current, correct 
information. Yeah, it would, it would um, if I understand your question correctly, it, it, you would have, for example, I was talking earlier about you would have identified the users of the dashboard, so you could have different user groups. Mm -hmm. You could have, say, uh, an accounting finance user group, you could have uh, you know, an operations user group, and the dashboard for that particular user group may have certain things on there that they're going to use more often. Uh, now, to the extent that they may need some information from accounting and finance, for example, that could potentially, what might normally not be at their fingertips, could potentially be put on their dashboard <coughs> as well. And they can access yes. it without mm -hmm. going through the... With, without asking somebody else. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What finance. we don't want is if somebody has to wait to do part of their job because somebody else has to go do some work to get it to them. Okay, and then how long is this going to take to happen? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I gave it to the end of next week, right? Yeah. <laughs> next week, because I really like the dashboard. It sounds so fast and snappy. Yeah. As I said, we're very early in the process. We're currently meeting with vendors. Uh, we have a meeting uh, tomorrow, actually, with another vendor. So uh, it's really hard to answer that. I, re I really don't. I wouldn't want to say something and it would just be completely it's, wrong about it. Put it this way, it's not even in the budget yet. Yeah, we're, doing right. all the leg, we're doing all the legwork right now to bring it to the board through the budget. Right. Right. It's, it's not even approved yet. It's so. not even approved yet. Yeah. This is something <laughs> we still have to bring through the board Thank for consideration. It's an exploratory phase, yeah. I guess. Safe answer. Yes. <laughs> This is kind of the uh, the mythical uh, heaven of the IT department <laughs> <Right>. to, <laughs> to uh, press one button and get exactly. the most answers yeah. uh, and do the least amount of uh, uh, shuffling. Uh, anyway, you, your presentation about dashboard was a lot different than I thought it was. So okay. I, thanks for that. You gave me a little bit of depth as to what it was because I was a little bit selfish about that. I thought it was just about how things were presented mm -hmm. to me. And uh, it is, in one sense, but uh, you just have to figure out what I want, and it's easier for you to get that information. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, uh, I think you've got a lot of work ahead of you, because I, I don't think it's ever attainable. I, th I think because all you need is for, is for one, one department software not to be supported anymore, and that changes now mm -hmm. the, the, whole, the whole kit and caboodle. But it's something that you have to do. Yeah. So. And, and that is something where, uh, exploring we are cognizant of the fact that um, the the packages that we're exploring we want to make sure that they are uh, built for the future as well so that if for example you know one of the underlying software packages was changed or something changed it does have the capability to be updated to be uh, compatible with that right so anyway thank you good sure. explanation mm -hmm. and, and one last thing because it came up today with all this IT, it's fantastic, and I'm glad that you're now working for us, and it looks like you're going to want to enlarge your department very shortly. I've had this iPad a year, and today it was shut down. Everybody's was, for no apparent reason. And when the IT guy came and fixed uh, Director Hernandez, he said, is this fixing? He goes, well, I hope so. <laughs> uh, is it going to work better than that? Uh, boy, I hope so. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. There's your answer. There. Uh, I mean, some of this is like I love IT, right. but if you can't get these to function really yeah. well, yeah. why are we going off trying to do a dashboard that we another? I, I just <coughs> let's get to work. Point yeah. out. <laughs> Point taken. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Thank no you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Sure. Great presentation. That was also a note and file. And now I think we're going to hear from the assistant general manager. I'm not sure. Because he's changed his appearance once again. I think he's running from the law. He's either the assistant general manager or he's the magician. I'm going to say that. Uh, we're going to do the revised debt management policy resolution. And this will be for a roll call vote. Yes, Mr. President, members of the board. You have before you, starting on page 28 of your board packet, a draft a debt management policy and an accompanying staff report. Debt management policy was established about six, over six years ago, and uh, the only time, the last time we issued, had a big debt issuance, a, a bond issuance, was in 2005. So it's not something that's uh, used frequently because we don't go out to debt much. Our last two debt issuances were private placements, and, uh, yeah, but we did review it. It's one of the things we reviewed, and we have about three changes to them. One of the uh, provisions in the existing policy is for an annual review. 
And we looked at the annual review and said, we don't need an annual review. We, we, it's not like we're issuing debt throughout the year. So we changed that uh, in, the, in the draft um, to be the recommendation is just to be periodic review. So in other words, if we had a pending issuance of a, of a big bond issuance, then we'd say, you know, we better look at this policy and make sure everything's in line. So that was the first change. Uh, the other change was to have a more conservative hedge on variable rate debt, and I'll tell you what that means. Variable rate debt is great, uh, uh, lower interest rates, but, the, but it's a risk. You know, the risk is if uh, interest rates shoot up, then all of a sudden you have a variable rate that you don't control and it goes through the roof. Well, that really doesn't matter if you have the same amount of uh, money that you have as debt in cash equivalents and short-term marketable securities, because if your interest rate shoots up on your variable debt, your interest rate is probably shooting up on your investments that you have too, and it offsets it, it's a hedge. But what if you have $100 million in debt and only $10 million in cash equivalents and short-term marketable investments? So, so there's gotta be a hedge, there's gotta be some guidance that you have uh, before you keep issuing variable rate debt. Currently, our policy says that our hedge position is 150% of our reserves. So in other words, if we had 10 million in reserves, we can go ahead and have up to 15 million in variable rate, variable rate debt. We want that to be a little more conservative and we brought that down to 125%. So that's the other, the second change that we recommend. The third change is a very technical change. When we went through the uh, private placement, our last private placement um, uh, last year, or it's 2012 now, uh, at the end of 2012, one of the questions that we had to answer on an IRS form was, do you have in your debt policy remedies if your tax exempt status changes? And we had to say, no, you know, we, we couldn't check the box, yes, but we put an explanation at, we're revising our debt policy to add those. Now, the reason why I say it's very technical is you know, very rare, I mean, it would never happen, you know, that we'd actually change our tax exempt status. And if I can explain to you, we have a tax exempt status on our debt because we use our debt proceeds for public benefit. So the investors in our debt get a, a, a lower return, but they don't have to include it in their income tax for federal and state tax. So that enables us to borrow at less than a, a private uh, entity could borrow. But if we, you know, all of a sudden change the, for example, Metalark. We used public debt, we, we had a bond issuance, we funded some of uh, Metalark expansion, and it was for public benefit, to reclaim water and process sewer. And if all of a sudden we decide we need alternative of revenue source, and we say, okay, how about Metalark bar and grill? Well, it wasn't supposed to be, you know, a bar and a grill and with a salad bar and, and live music and all that stuff. And we would, we would have to, uh, we would change the tax exempt status and all of a sudden those investors would see, well, you can't exclude that from tax anymore. So it's a big thing that would happen. Now we have remedies for that in our, our policy in this draft that you have and it would be to either divest of the activity that you changed or, um, or change it back. So anyway, that's, that's all I have for you. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, but the staff recommends that you consider and adopt the new uh, debt management policy resolution. So question to staff? I move we accept staff's recommendation. Second. Motion is second on the floor. There will be resolution number. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 Thank you, Tom. Okay, moving on to reports, general manager's report. Just a couple real quick things. Happy New Year's. Hope you guys all had a, had a nice New Year because we uh, did change the schedule around quite a bit um, to accommodate January and the changes and New Year's being on the first Monday, first Wednesday. Um, you've all probably seen the, um, the news clipping that Diane passes on to you every day from the Water Authority, has all the news things. I printed out um, today's. There were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four, sixteen articles in today's yeah. clipping. Out of those sixteen articles, fourteen were drought. Mm -hmm. um, nothing, no action has been taken. They, uh, Director Evans might be able to speak to this after January's board meeting uh, with the Water Authority, but it's becoming an issue um, sooner than later, I believe now. Um, I'm not quite sure of the position that. Um, 
met in the Water Authority will be taken. I think that's going to evolve over the next two months, depending on what happens as far as rainfall. I don't know what it will be. Um, I've asked staff to start looking into all of our existing policies that we had with respect to drought management, the drought rate structure, because as you may recall, it used to be a six tier rate structure during drought. It's only three during non-drought times. So we're looking at all that just in case, but I have a feeling this is going to be a big topic uh, over the next few months for the board uh, to talk about. A bit unrelated, but uh, we're involved in a, the project and, and the stormwater requirements for this project are horrific. And they have just changed here recently. And I was wondering, is the water, was the water industry <coughs> involved with the state with that uh, stormwater changing? I think you're talking about what they call phase two of the stormwater pollution prevention plan. Yes. Uh, phase fun, phase fun. I and wouldn't that, call I wouldn't call it phase fun. Phase one of the program involved the bigger people. It was the cities, the counties, school districts, people that had very large sites that could uh, I don't want to say the low-hanging fruit, but it was the big people that you could really control the storm drain runoff. The new program is coming into effect. Uh, it doesn't impact public water agencies because again it's a runoff when we don't have water rights nor do we are we responsible for the um, MS4 permits mm -hmm. which is the storm runoff permit that cities and counties have to apply for so I think there may have been some involvement from the authority and maybe some of the water agencies as members of the committees but I don't believe there was a lot of direction from public water agencies Thank you. Uh, so I think that is coming up. Um, some discussions. George Portman. So it's really no news to us about the drought because I don't think it ever went away. But um, So there's another thing about energy is that uh, a certain amount of our power is hydroelectric. And yes. so uh, uh, there's something that's kind of unpredictable, which is the cost of electricity due to the failure to be able to produce it hydro through your hydroelectric power no matter where we get it, from Washington or Nevada or wherever. There's a lot of that, and that's where the mention, the note was made earlier, the nexus between water and power right. didn't used to be that big of a concern because we helped keep everything running on a consistent basis. But now you're looking at the fact that the bulk of the power in the state is going to water and sewer. So it's a huge nexus now that they're starting to realize. Then you start throwing into some of the issues. You can hear the Cala this coming two weeks. It's um, they're talking about uh, steelhead, they'll be talking about replacing steelhead, oh, yeah. how to get back up the canyons. Well, what some of that means is they have to release a certain amount of water at a certain time at a much greater rate than they can use the power on the grid. So when you've got these big reservoirs that are generating hydroelectric power, they may reduce, they may generate a whole bunch in a short period, but we can't use it, so they don't generate the power. Then they have releases that are much less the rest of the year. So it's going to be... The next decade, I would say, is going to be very interesting with respect to power. Uh, the only other item, there is the closed session today with respect to the beginning of the uh, annual review for the general manager. What I've passed out before you here is free information. Jeff will go over this in more detail with you in closed session. But this is the process that the board came up with um, last um, October, November of 2012 on the process that they go through for the general manager review. So you can see it actually takes four board meetings to get through the process. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff will have some information he'll provide to you in closed session today. Um, as you can see from the first two meetings, it's really a closed session between council and the board. I don't attend these meetings, so once you get down to closed session, I'll just ask Jeff to come out with a report in public session and then adjourn the meeting and you're done. But Jeff will walk you through all this uh, in the balance of the meeting. And uh, that's all I have. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the uh, notice was put out as indicated we would do by the board with respect to the vacancies uh, for the board. The deadline was 4.30 today to submit applications. You do have the three applications before you uh, that were turned in. Uh, their uh, Form 700 uh, conflict statement plus their resume, lack of better term, letter of interest. The uh, meeting on next Monday is a special meeting. We will confirm with the three attendees what time to be here um, and then uh, it'll be a special meeting on Monday for the board to uh, consider um, filling the vacancy. Maybe have to answer any questions. Okay, moving on. Uh, legal counsel. Happy, Happy New Year. A couple of things. Um, the uh, there was a little change to the Brown Act 
that uh, occurred uh, last year basically was um, signed into law and was uh, SB 751. So it's going to require that uh, we public report, publicly report any action taken in any meeting and the vote or abstention on that action of each member present. So we used to kind of get away with um, motion second, all in favor, say aye. Now it looks like this kind of converts it into, as, we, as you take actions, it's going to be roll call votes. That's a practice we've sort of encouraged over the years and we've done here. But that looks like now that's the way it's got to be under the Brown Act and it's got to be properly reflected in the minutes. So um, I don't think it's going to change things around here much, but it is important to know that that's what the, <coughs> the um, new law is and what the Brown Act says. The so, other, <coughs> I'm sorry, so we're going to incorporate that starting tonight we actually had it. We, in, in general, we already do that. Yeah. We're just going to fine tune the process of dying and have to make sure that there's a name down by who, when it says all, all I and everybody says yes, they'll just have all five names. Yeah. Um, there was also an interesting case came down last month uh, relating to the Public Records Act. This is sort of an area that's gotten more and more attention because we've got so much electronic uh, information and there's just it just seems to be something of interest to uh, the public. And you have to balance the public's right to know on the one hand with privacy issues and frankly I think more and more how much does it cost to get some of this information and retrieve some of this information, how much, uh, uh, you know, uh, how many workers do you have to do, uh, do this kind of stuff and how expensive it can be for a public agency. Anyway, in any event, the uh, Court of Appeal held that the uh, public agency, and this is kind of interesting, cannot be required to seek records that it does not prepare, own, use, or retain. And that's what's happened is, is that more and more we've looked at, because of the electronic situation, there's constructive possession of <clears throat> records that might be in a consultant's office, even in an attorney's office, or things like that, that could be considered public records. And this case really was um, a request by Reuters News Service to the regents for individual fund information for investments made by the regents of the University of California. And this was notwithstanding uh, the regents had, had conceded that the uh, records uh, related to the public's business. It was some of the financial information and stuff. And I won't go into all the gory details, but it just shows that the pendulum kind of moves back and forth and the courts are being a little bit sensitive now that sometimes uh, you know, we're not going to trouble the public agency to have to go back and you know, uh, sort through a lot of records to, uh, that, that could be public business but not necessarily public records. So anyway, the rest still will be confined to closed session. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Paul? Director Paul? Well, that was not very enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> what is considered to be a public record? Well, a public record is anything that is prepared, owned, used, or retained in the conduct, conduct of the public's business. So just a, virtually all the records that we, have, that we have here, unless there's an exemption that's been created by law, are considered public records. And in this case, they were looking at records that were frankly the, public, the regents has access to but is, is specific investment, individual investment funds that, that may be off-site and in the investment bank that they were, uh, you know, or the, uh, as part of their portfolio. And the court felt that, that you didn't have to go all out uh, to uh, look into the fund balance or to it look into the uh, investment banking uh, funds in order to uh, uh, retrieve that information under the Public Records Act. So is there a clear line? Uh, no, there's not, and, and, that, and that's why, you know, it, there is never a clear line right. here, but what's happening is, is there is this, there has been this moment, uh, movement that uh, uh, records, for example, that are used in the context of preparation of CEQA documents by your consultant, and they ultimately, this, the, uh, uh, they come before the board, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the negative deck or the environmental impact report. So there's been some considerable fights over whether or not the records, the background information and the records that may be maintained by the consultant, whether those, and, and they ultimately, they're, they're utilized to be incorporated into the environmental report, for example, whether or not those records, yeah. 
even though they're indirect records, are part of the Public Records Act. And more and more, we're seeing uh, those types of records actually come in and, and become part of the public records. It hasn't gone quite that far yet, but this is an example of where I think the courts are looking at it and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, there are some limits here as to what we're going to impose on the public agency to find these uh, records. So there is no, unfortunately, there's no bright lines, but it's good for business. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Director Evans, San Diego County Water Authority. I had something really great to say, but I kind of got lost there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's okay. I'm just, my head's full of records now. Um, tomorrow is a, there's, um, <laughs> at, down at the Water Authority, they're holding a public hearing, and you may have seen it on the clips, but there's a public hearing at 6, and they'll be addressing um, three sort of related draft documents that um, have to do with the strategic directions through 2035 and um, the hearing is at 6 p.m. if any of you would like to come and they will be I want to make sure I get the right words here they will be looking at the regional water facilities optimization and master plan update the climate action plan and the associated environmental documents those documents were released in November and they've extended the date I think it will be um, very interesting and a, a lot of this energy stuff is going to come up and this I'm sure will be a big topic for us. I know when um, you read the media clips and you see the drought, you realize it's nothing new, but it's finally at a point where people, Start it's, it's not going to be, I don't think it's a drought, I think it's a lifestyle change and that is a whole different ball of wax to work with. So, I will report back anyway when I come to that. And just in that, I know that uh, uh, Director Evans and I have gone on a lot of these trips this year, and uh, <laughs> there was no water anywhere. It was it was just amazing that no one was talking drought. Right. You know, it's like everyone's afraid to use the word, but it's there isn't water. We don't even use it. It's the D word at this point. Oh. It's, it's just the D word right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Senior Wastewater Authority, Director Portal. It's been a long time. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think we've, uh, I know we as far as policy and capital finance, there hasn't been anything since that. No, uh, the 15th is our capital uh, uh, meeting, and the uh, 22nd is the board meeting, so okay. we will report once we have something to report. Okay. Uh, item 3.5, director's report on travel, conference, or seminar. Anyone? No, we have gone in. No. Time. We're going to move right along to other business. 4.1 meetings. Um, I'm going to mention this. Um, I assume this is why I do mention it. Uh, uh, there is a meeting Monday. We're going to be having at 4 o'clock here to interview the three applicants that we have received for Director Ferguson's uh, position in District 4. Uh, what I'm proposing is that we will have the applicants here. We'll ask them all to step outside. Uh, and call them in one at a time so that none of them is the benefit of another one's 10 minute, uh, uh, whatever they want to say, and Q&A period, which will last as long as the board wants it to. But I'm, I'm guessing 10 minutes is long enough for them to tell us whatever it is they need, uh, they, they feel like saying, and then whatever Q&A mm -hmm. the board feels like asking. Um, and we'll do this with all three. Uh, and so those, uh, we'll have the other people here, then we'll bring them all three in. Uh, I'll make a nomination. Uh, there'll either be a second or there won't, um, and then we'll see what happens from there, and I'll go right down the line. Director Pono next, Director Hernandez next, Director Hernandez next, there's only three of them, so uh, whoever gets a majority vote, the first one who gets the majority vote, gets the position. That that correct, Counselor? Yes. Okay, and I would warn everybody that <clears throat> interviewing someone for this position, <laughs> we all know we all worked very hard to get here. Uh, it's great for them to be there. They're only going to be there for until November, and they'll have to run the ele their election process, and they'll have to run again another two years. Um, but it's the same as interviewing for an, employ an employment job. You, know, you cannot ask any personal questions, and I'm sure our council will be on hand to stop us. You can't ask where they live, how many kids they have, what school they go to. You can't ask any personal questions whatsoever. Same as a job application, and I'm sure the council will step in if we yeah. misstep. And the next thing is, 
I'd like to call a meeting, uh, and I, I don't see it on my, my board of directors sheet, but, uh, and, and maybe I'm just missing, but I had director uh, Hernandez look for it too. Five uh, he and one. I are both on an outreach. Uh, well, let me just go back to the minutes and I'll tell you. Okay. I have a, a thing here and I just don't see it here. Uh, let's see, you got Public Awareness Personnel Committee, Hal Martin is the chair, and Jim Hernandez is the um, alternative. Yeah, we, we it's, not, it's not here. Not on this little sheet. The little That's sheet all. that I have in front of me? It's not there. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll fix that. No big deal, I just, I, I didn't know what to call it. So yeah, it's, a, a, it's the legal, why. it's the uh, legal, no, excuse me, Public Awareness Personnel Policy. Public Awareness, okay. Um, I'd like to schedule a meeting uh, ASAP uh, with uh, Jim and myself and whoever you designate, uh, Mr. General Manager, and uh, get to work on uh, doing our outreach program. Okay, uh, what I'll Diane do is coordinate with the two of you and pick a date that's convenient. Perfect. That's great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, go ahead, and Director Hernandez. Do we have a, a, a general time and or a specific time when our strategic meeting is going to take place? Uh, I'm actually meeting with Michelle Tamayo tomorrow morning. Oh, good. Um, so she's been, uh, she's been out of the country since uh, before the holidays. Uh, uh -huh. She got back this week. We'll meet tomorrow. Uh, Tom and I will be meeting with her and go over what she's proposing. Diane will then reach out to the four of you, hopefully the fifth, uh, to schedule time that she would come in and meet with you individually firm up the um, agenda based upon topics that you have to make sure everything's covered and then we'll start looking to schedule the workshop. Thank you. And, and looking at our schedule, it looks like we're pretty pretty busy in February, January, February, maybe even March. I don't know. You, you, you be honest the way this is looking just because uh, we, I don't, I don't think you can be as busy as you were at the first of the year last year, but you still got a lot of topics coming. So I'm going to say probably latter part of February, most likely the first week, two weeks of March. Be honest. Okay. Anything else under meetings for anyone? No. Next thing, director's comments, future agenda items. I have a couple. Uh, we've talked about this, but Special District Leadership Foundation, and I know staff's been working on it, but I'd like to get that on our agenda. Which? Uh, the SDLA. Uh, is this the transparency certification? The transparency, yeah. Yeah, what we've done is the board's already approved us to do it. Right. We came back to the order that was in September, October last year. Right. We couldn't get it actually through the process until the website went live. The website went live in the last, the latter part of last month. We've already made contact with Michael Lott, who's the executive officer of LAFCO. He's agreed to sit in on the uh, peer review. And then Kimberly Thorner, who's the general manager of Leavening, they both agreed to sit in. Um, Tom and Lisa are coordinating that with them. It's not something the board does. So from a transparency standpoint, the board is out of it. You have to bring in two of your peers from the industry. They do an independent review. Once they complete that review, they then finish an application. We turn that into SDLF, and they are the ones who actually issue the board the certification of transparency. My, my understanding is the board does need to obtain a certain amount of training as a whole. That's a different certification. The, the transparency one is the one I was talking about. But the rest of this, um, is the board certification for everybody having gone through it and we can just sit down with you to make sure that you have the flyer to do that that that's easy enough that's just scheduling of the training okay I, again i just wanted to schedule because i wanted to know what the board needs to do what you need to do in a timeline as to when it's going to happen yeah we'll get, so we've we talked about it since october yeah yeah okay i want to get a date certain sure. of when we're going to have this yeah they are two different issues like i said one is the board certification sure the other is the transparency of the district well, both. right yeah, okay so you're both sure just two President, President, right. yes, and I, I did receive just uh, this day or so that uh, the, i think i'm missing one component financing and it's coming up and i don't know how the, rest okay. of the board is but we, yeah we'll get a chart together of what you've attended and make sure we get it perfect. up. perfect thank you are those a series of classes that at one time, the board had completed all of that, but with new board members, they had. They had yeah, um, the board had all the old <clears throat> past board had all completed right. it, and I'm not sure if the one that um, Director Evans Martin that you went to that really long one, mm -hmm. it may that's have been. New. I think that's the new process that took care of everything at right. once. Oh, that's new. Yeah, I'm Jim, assuming that you've been through this before. Jim's gone through them. I think all we have was one, 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 one class. One, yeah, yeah. The second. Right. But just to let us know sure. where, where, where is we need to be because we don't want to be behind staff. Absolutely. I know staff's working on this day and night, <coughs> much like a dashboard, yeah. um, to get the transparency. Sure. Which I think has a little higher priority. Um, 
future agenda items. Okay, uh, the proposed policy change of deferring capacity and impact fees. I could have swore we were trying to get in before the end of last year, and that didn't happen for whatever reason. And we, uh, I think we had talked about January, but um, um, I would request that uh, if it was proposed to be on the 22nd board meeting, I will not be here, and I'm the one that brought it to the, the discussion. If we could defer that at a meeting, I don't think it's going to make or break anything. And that's fine by me, but will it be the first meeting in February? If that's when you want me to bring it back. I, I deferred it at the request of the chair last time until after yeah. the first of the year. Perfect. Then we'll, and we'll you're now the chair, so if you want it back the first meeting in February, so be it. Yeah, well, the first meeting in February makes sense. Okay. Thank you. That'd be great. Um, and we're still under direct comments. Uh, I remember Director Ferguson always asked the same question to staff. And now I'm going to start asking the same question, so be prepared. These PowerPoints, we didn't get them until we got here. Mm -hmm. And I know they work on until the last minute, but maybe you need to change that last minute to the day before so that we can get them, so that we can look through these. Sure, there's two issues that we usually have on that. One is at the same time we make it available to the public, as to the boards, and we have to make it available to the public. Yeah. So that's the, usually the lag time. If we can get it done sooner, we'll do our best to get it to you sooner. Okay, that would be great. Commentary by anyone else? I just have one more question. Yes. If I would like to come to your outreach meeting, could I do that? Uh, it is a public, uh, I've been told by staff that it's a public meeting that we had and we posted as a public meeting. I, I never heard of that happening before committee meetings, but if you do it here, that's fine by me. But as long as it's a posted meeting, Yes, the public's invited. Well, the, you got to be careful because yeah. you get a quorum, you get three of, of you there, not. and and you well, can you can. Meeting. My recommendation would be not to. Not but, because. But but there is yeah, but there is an issue if you can be what they call an observer. But the problem with that is inevitably, you know, arguments are that <laughs> don't you don't twitch. You know, somebody yeah, don't opens twitch. their mouth. Don't twitch. Yeah. See, no. but, there is a, there is a difference at the fact that it is posted as a committee meeting and not a board meeting yes and because it's a committee meeting it's just compromise of those two and when the third does show up it just does create a it becomes a special meeting of the whole right. really right. arguably okay. no. yeah. and then we'd have to have it in a different room exactly i'm not going to talk about committee <laughs> no thanks okay okay um but that's a very good question thank you very much mm. and then uh seeing no other questions we're going to move to, pursuant to government code section 54957, public employee performance evaluation on the general manager. We're going to move to a closed session. And unfortunately, general public, we have our closed sessions in this meeting, yeah, in this room. Sure. Maybe we'll need change that someday, so we have to ask you all to leave so we can have it. You Thank you very much for coming. You need a motion, motion and a second. Oh, yeah. Motion, motion to move to closed session. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.